we're going to go through some examples of the kinds of things that we want to do in our uh, homework and in the future in terms of reading articles and understanding what kind of design was used for a study and then later what is the quality of that design and implementation. In our first example, we have eight cases of adenocarcinoma of the vagina in young women were reported at the hospital in Boston between 1966 and 69. Prior to this, the condition was rarely reported. The unusual occurrence of this tumor in these women, all born in New England hospitals between 1946 and 51, led to an investigation. Attention was particularly directed at the history of maternal ingestion of estrogens during the pregnancy that might be associated with patients with vaginal adenocarcinoma. So what we have are eight cases. And what we do not have is any controls. We have no randomization. We have what is really basically known as a case series. And these cases then can be looked at in depth to understand both retrospectively and retrospectively we can find about the, their mother's ingestion of estrogen. We can do investigation. We can also look forward in time to find out what happened to them. But we have nobody to compare them to, and so there's no statistical analysis that can be done with this group. But these are very important for hypothesis generation and really sort of following through with some ideas. They're inexpensive, and you can certainly investigate rare diseases. In this example, we have a random sample of middle-aged, sedentary males selected from four census tracts. Each man was examined for coronary artery disease, and all those having the disease were excluded from the study. All others were randomly assigned to either an exercise group, which followed a two-year program of systematic exercise, or to a control group, which had no exercise program. Both groups were observed annually for any difference in incidence of coronary artery disease. Now first, we say, what kind of study is this? And we see in this particular um, example, the word random is used many times. So let's have our antenna up for randomized trial, and is it? But we start with a population of people that then um, are chosen from, uh, and they go through a series, they're chosen from four census tracts, which has a population-based sampling, and then they have done some exclusion criteria, including um, anybody that's not male, not sedentary, and not middle-aged would be not be included. And so among the people for these four census tracts, they've picked out the middle-aged sedentary males, and so those are the first group of evaluation, um, I'll call participants, I guess, and um, they were then examined for coronary artery disease. So the first thing that happens is, do they have disease or no disease? If they did not have disease, they were then um, maintained. If they had disease, they were excluded. So now we have this group, the no disease group, and they are randomized to two different treatment arms, one with, uh, or two different arms. One is the treatment arm, and the other is the um, control arm. This does not make it a case control study because it has controls, but it is a control arm of a randomized trial. And in this case, they're randomized in two different levels. Uh, here first between once they've decided that they are, they've selected the no disease, they randomize them into controls and treatment and earlier. But this is a randomized control trial. And sometimes drawing out what happens um, helps you try to figure out both if it's retrospective or prospective. It also helps you figure out what the design is. And sometimes there'll be a mixed design. In this situation, we have 100 patients with infectious hepatitis and 100 matched neighborhood well controls that were questioned regarding a history of eating clams or oysters within the preceding three months. So you start first with cases. And you pick those cases, and then you say, well, I want somebody to compare them with, kind of like a control group. And so you pick another people, another group of people similar to your cases, and these controls would be selected. In this case, they were people who lived in the same neighborhood. And they're assuming that 
people who live in the same neighborhood perhaps are similar in other ways in terms of their environmental exposure, perhaps in terms of socioeconomic status, perhaps in terms of their eating habits. Not always true, but in this case they felt like, okay, maybe there are enough similarities. They then questioned these people about previous behavior for the past three months. So it's a retrospective analysis, but it's a case control study. And they tell us this by uh, telling that there are controls and that we have picked them by the cases. In this example, we are going to assess the prevalence of upper respiratory symptoms by questionnaires were mailed to every tenth person listed in the city phone directory. Each person was asked to list demographic characteristics and smoking habits during the preceding seven days. 60% of questionnaires were completed and returned, which is by, may, may I say, an outrageously wonderful return rate and unlikely, but it would be great if that were true. Prevalence rates of upper respiratory symptoms were determined from the responses. So what we do know is that out of the entire population, that people, that every tenth person was chosen from a phone directory. So there's no chance of being selected if you're not in the phone directory, but this is a pretty big, this is a pretty good sample, and we then, out of each of those people, mailed a questionnaire, 60% returned, 40% did not return, and they were asked about prevalence of symptoms. You don't follow them forward, you ask a little bit about what happened in the past, but basically this is a cross-sectional study or a prevalence study, as it might be called. And you can do basic prevalence, um, and you can generalize it to the population. As long as you look at those people who return the questionnaires and feel like that you have a sample that's relevant to the population, if it turned out that you had um, a really different kind of sample of respondents than the city, and you might compare of the people responding by age and sex and smoking habits compared to your general population, if there were big differences, you might feel like it wasn't generalizable. But these are the sorts of examples that we might give to have you try to sort out the kind of sample, or the study design that's been done, and then in the upcoming weeks we'll begin to assess the quality of the study design as well as sources of bias and confounding.